what challenges arise when you're trying to instill that genuine care and empathy into your teams. We have something that is called uh, LACE, L-A-C-E, you know, listen, uh, ask questions, confirm, you know, the information that you got from your customers, and then educate, okay, on whatever you're trying to do. If, if you go through that process, then you can show the customers that you care about what they're trying, what they're trying to do, and also deliver a different message of the reasons why sometimes you may not be able to get to the price that they're trying to be, you know, get to the payment that they're trying to be, get that appointment at the day and time that they wanted it to get it. And then what is the concept when down the road? How the other teams, if I don't set up the appointment and I don't set the expectations the proper way on the service side, it's going to affect the service advisor. It's going to affect the mechanics. It's going to affect everything else. And then your CSI, same thing on the sales side. All right, welcome into Backstop Billions. I am your host, Brooke Furness, and we have the amazing pleasure to welcome in the one and only Martha Alvarado from Laundry's Toyota. Oh my goodness, I am so excited to bring you in, man. This has been, it's been a little bit in the making here, and I'm super, 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 super excited to have you come in today and speak to us today about something I know that's really, really near and dear to your heart. And as, as we were talking offline, we both have, uh, I'd say it's close to both of us heart, but I'm really excited for you to, to dive into this day about how coaching teams should generally care about customer and making real changes and not just pretending to make that. So let's start with the big, big picture here, Martha. Like I'm super, super excited to jump, jump in this to you with you today, not to jump and attack you because it almost came out that way. Although I probably could jump to the screen and like give you a big hug because I'd really like to do that as well. But it might have to wait until like digital dealer when I see your face next. Maybe, just maybe. But let's start with the, the first question here about how does cultivating a culture of genuine care affect customer relationships and overall business success? Okay, so... Your culture is going to have a big impact. And thank you so much, Brooke, for having me here. It's very exciting. Thank you very much. I always enjoy all of our conversations, right? Time goes really fast when we... <laughs> it's not, awesome, man. Yes. So, you know, showing care, I mean, showing care, it's, it's so important. It's so relevant, right? We've been talking a lot about empathy. We've been talking a lot about how the industry has changed since COVID. I think we're expecting a different level of service to ourselves. You know, you were talking about your um, uh, your experience with uh, your uh, niece's gift, remember? Oh, yes. Well, oof. Right? It, that was rough. I had a recently an experience with some of uh, one of the airlines. And, and a lot of the times, you know, even though the company doesn't have the best thing, it's also the interaction that we have with the person, right? Either face-to-face -face or on the phone when we call. So implementing that culture, it's going, it's going to have a domino effect on everything else that you do, okay? Starts from your reception is at a dealership. The minute that they actually walk in there because they're looking for a salesperson, they answer the phone call because they're looking for a service appointment. From there, you know, the experience has to be really, really, you know, uh, a good one. So you, it, 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 it's going to take involvement. You want to make sure that everybody is involved. But most importantly, everybody understands the reasons why, you know, yes. that we, everybody understands why do we need to do this, that we can actually show them, hey, listen, if we continue acting or doing things in this way, down the road, this department, that department, and this department, they're going to be facing these obstacles or consequences. Or it's going to be very easier on the process also for them. And if that happens, this is how the customer is going to perceive the whole experience that they have had with our uh, company, you know, with our dealership, with our departments. So it's, it's, I think it's also tweaking the mentality that we have had so far on how we do things and what we coach them on, on constantly. Empathy is a skill. It, you know, it's it, not everybody. Is, it, it's something that is not very easy sometimes to show. And it ha there is so many things involved on it. it. It's your own 
personal agenda, how your day is going, you know, it's going to have to do a lot, you know, on, on how are you going to respond to a client or to a customer. So it, it's a lot, but, but it's, but it's on the, it's on the making, you know. It's, it's, and we were talking offline that there are, I don't know that empathy can necessarily be taught. Either you have it or you don't. I don't know. I'm not sure that it can be taught. I, I don't know. Maybe that's up for debate on the show. I'm not sure if it is or not, but it's, it is. And, and you can quickly tell whether you're being authentic or not. So that leads me to my next question of, can the authenticity of care be measured in a business context? And if so, how? It's very hard to measure, I think, you know? I, I mean, I haven't figured out a way of measuring you know how to, you know how my reps or the person, the people around me can be authentic, uh, and as you said, it it's it's I don't, it's also very hard to be thought. Okay, it's something that sometimes it have to be natural. I think the best way for some people to change a little bit their approach it's by constantly being exposed, yeah. you know, to that type of behavior. If everybody around you shows empathy, then you start absorbing, you know, that sentiment and you start kind of like reflecting it and maybe copying it, trying to, you know, follow the example or follow the, you know, the, the behaviors that the other ones, it's like a bad attitude. I don't think everybody's born with a bad attitude, you know, it, it just happens. So I wouldn't say that it, it is contagious, it's not, but it's something that it can be absorbed by your surroundings if you are exposed constantly you know to show the empathy towards others towards your co-workers you know then it, it hopefully eventually it starts you know coming naturally from you and the measure part I think the best way to measure you know how we care about our customers and what we see the results. We see customers coming back being happy. We receive our, we see our reviews, you know, it's not something that you can say, well, you were at eight today. You need to be on a 10. You are like, you're not getting your quota of how authentic you should be today. You know, because how do you want to measure when you respond to a lead, how you answer your incoming call? I think it's going to reflect on the overall performance of your dealership. How are you perceived by your community? How are you perceived by the customers, your loyal customers? How do you retain them? And that's, I think, that the best measure that we can have. If if our customers are not coming back, if your customers, you know, are not giving you a good response, then we got to really, you know, dive deep and try to figure out what is causing that type of reaction. And I, I want to take that one step further. We were talking offline of just some of the things that you do with your team. And I know we're going to probably get this a little bit further, but and it may not be necessarily measured in a number, in a ones and zeros and Excel spreadsheet and everything in between. But you happen to say something that was, was your, like I said, we were speaking beforehand that I go, oh, we definitely got to bring that up. Is you said, hey, instead of waiting until that end of the month report comes out or the end of the day report comes out, you go, I just, you know what, team, I just heard that conversation. Why don't we take it right now and learn from that? Now, is that maybe quantified and measurable, maybe not so much, but qualitative, yeah, that's 100% measurable because your team automatically, it is still fresh in their mind. Hey, let's take that conversation and learn from that right now why it's fresh in your mind. So on my mind, when I look at facts versus feelings, that from a factual standpoint, I know that even if like, I'm a, as we all know, I love my sports, that I know that if I, if I go back and I watch the film right after I've done something, I know that, oh God, man, I missed that layup and now I know I know how to I know how to to make that better. Oh man, okay, now I, I can see that if I, you know, if I go this way and I can see how to defend that person better. So taking your team and knowing that if I take this and we can automatically correct behavior now, or not that it's necessarily bad behavior, we can just make it better. So I love how I don't know if you want to speak that a little bit. maybe I just stole your thunder a little bit here, but I love that you brought that up about how you automatically take how what what they're doing and saying, here's some pointers how to improve. And not to, and just a very, I just love how you did that. Thank you. Thank you. I think what happened is when we wanted to try to change the culture around our teams, we have to be very attentive. Okay. Because when we have little kids, right. And they're learning how to talk. Why is it that we watch what we say, how we say it? With the, <laughs> and it's because we know that they're going to absorb everything that they're going to repeat it. Correct. So it's the same thing. We're trying to change their behaviors. We're trying to change their approach. We're trying to instill in them 
uh, mentality where they need to show empathy, they need to, uh, you know, show up caring, caring, caring for our, our customers. So whatever interaction they're having and whenever you have the time, you need to be close to pay attention and see what had happened. Most of the times what, what we do is like, okay, we're going to bring it up on our next meeting. We're going to bring it up on the next training. By then, if it's a week, you know, down the road, or if it's a month down the road, by then, that person that just experienced that completely forgot about it. They completely forgot what had just happened before, okay? Because sometimes it may be influenced to a prior, you know, experience, you know, maybe the conversation with the prior customer, okay? They already forgot how they were actually reacting and they were saying, no, I didn't say that, right? Or I didn't act like that. That's not true. That's not how everything went. So be right there on the moment. And let's say, okay, let, what happened? And role play. Okay, so what is it that the customer told you? Okay. And what did you respond was? Right? And walk them through every single step of the conversation. It doesn't matter if it was in front. I mean, like face-to-face, -face, on the phone. Okay, interaction of text messages. And so, okay, now we slow, let, let, let it slow down. Okay. First of all, we have to find out why our salesperson, why our BDC, why our receptionist came up with an answer. Because maybe they got that, uh, that, you know, that information in the wrong way from, you know, from the wrong person. Okay. So clarify. Okay. Identify. Okay. This is an opportunity for, you know, it's a teaching lesson. This is how this is supposed to be. Then make them realize, how do you feel if you were the other person on the other side, like on the phone, for example? I deal with customers that sometimes are not a happy camper, you know, cars broke down in the middle of the road, right? And they want you to go and send someone to fix it. And are we always able to say yes and resolve every single issue? No. But the way that we're going to deliver the response is very important because at that moment, if, my, if I'm the one that is on the side of the road, if I'm the one that needs a tire, if I'm the one that, you know, is trying to find a part of the right price because my budget is very limited and I just got a total loss, how am I feeling, right? So what another thing that I like to do at those specific moments is bring prior experiences that they have had in their own life. You know, my reps, do you remember when this happens to you? Okay, so if you will have experienced this, if you will have been on that same position, what will it have been, what kind of reaction you will have gotten if someone will have responded to you in the way that you did? And that makes them realize, oh, I, yes, poof, you know what? Let all <laughs> right. <laughs> and then little by little, you know, they learn. And maybe you're just doing that coaching session with that person that is right there on the phone. Maybe they have two or three reps around and then you, you role play. I gather them all, uh, you know, because I rather telling my receptionist, hey, you know what? Hold my phone calls. Tell the customers now that my system went down. Okay. And take the name and phone number. We're going to give them a call back. And many of you may probably not say, well, that's not good customer service either. But you know what? But what will happen if down the road a week later, this same, he, your rep did the same behavior with 10 more, five, 10, 15 more customers? Yep. You're risking it. Yeah, you know? sure. And we have a tendency just to put it under the rock and move on and say, oh, we're going to talk about it later. We'll, no, you handle it right in there, you know? And it's then the they body. learn. It, and they also know that you're attentive. They also know that you're going to be like watching what they say and how they say. And sometimes... They may just do it because it's required, but have it. It becomes a habit, and sometimes it just becomes natural, being more, uh, you know, caring about the customer's needs. I love it. So taking it from there, then how do you differentiate, differentiate between your teams who are generally and genuinely empathetic and those who are just, yeah, they're just following a script because and checking boxes because they have to do it? Well, you know, when it comes to our service, when it comes to our BDC, for example, you know, the way that I can see when it's, it's, it's the connections that they built. I can see when they're setting up a little bit more appointments, okay? When one of them, and they, I monitor how many appointments we get from every single incoming call in our service BDC, okay? Because every call is an opportunity. Some of them are just checking for status and everything. And then I go, okay, out of all of these calls, why is, what was the reason that we couldn't set up an appointment? And then we have to slow down. 
Okay. And that they, and then they go like, okay, is it because it was an attitude issue? Because we weren't paying attention. We weren't listening to the customers. And we were just like, ah, let me answer the phone, you know, be, be over with and let's next move, uh, move to the next one. Okay. So the results at the end of the day, when the results are going to speak by themselves, you know, same thing on the sales side. The person that is able sometimes to engage with the customer is the one that is going to get the appointment. And that now, right now, not before, because I've been doing this for a long time, but right now, if you don't show caring, if you don't show that you're being authentic, you're not building that connection. So you're not earning the right to ask for the customer's business. Before it was different. 2000, you know, before the pandemic, it was very different. You, you, you have the luxury of just move on to the next lead. Not anymore. And I think that is the biggest realization that we have to like, you know, open our eyes to and, and, and realize that the approach has to be completely different and the measurements have to also be different. I love it. So that goes right into the, my next question for you is what challenges arise when you're trying to instill that genuine care and empathy into your teams? And then how do you overcome that of when you're trying to instill that genuine empathy into your teams? And you know, there's just some challenges that sometimes arise when you're trying to do that. I think the buy-in, the buy-in, the buy yes, the buy-in and the consistency being, you know, you know, first of all, you would have, you have to persist, co continually bring it up. You know, the reason why it's so important that we act like humans. Okay. And that we treat others, you know, in a different way if we want to earn their business. So why? Because sometimes they don't understand. If you have sales teams that for years have been trained on get the appointment, get the sales, you know, bring them in. Just get them in. Get them in the door. Get them in the door. Get them on the door. Get them on the door. And, and I challenge everybody that is seeing this podcast, you know, go to your teams, ask your salesperson, you know, what is the main purpose of the first phone call, email, or text, okay, that they send when they get an internet lead. And I bet you the majority of them are going to tell you, set the appointment. Yep which the purpose shouldn't be that, it should be connect. The goal is the appointment, but your purpose should be connect. And until they realize that, they're not going to change the approach. So they buy you from your teams, from the sales reps, from my BDC, to understand how this is going to affect the whole you know, relationship that we're going to have with our customers. It's very important. If you take a little bit more time, you know, and Toyota, we have something that is called uh, LACE, L-A-C-E, you know, listen, uh, ask questions, confirm, you know, the information that you got from your customers and then educate, okay? Or whatever you're trying to do, if, if you go through that process, then you can show the customers that you care about what they're trying, what they're trying to do, okay? And also deliver a different message of the reasons why sometimes you may not be able to get to the price that they're trying to be, you know, get to the payment that they're trying to be, get that appointment at the day and time that they wanted it to get it, get those repairs done in half an hour or in an hour. Be but, you know, it's the buy-in. And then what is the concept when down the road? You know, how the other teams, if I don't set up the appointment and I don't set the expectations the proper way in the service side, it's going to affect the service advisor. It's going to affect the mechanics. It's going to affect everything else. And then your CSI, same thing on the sales side. You know, you promised something that you shouldn't. You just said it because you just want to close the sale. How is that going to affect the people that is doing the after sale follow-up, your finance manager? And then the service department, when they come to service, expecting a service that you promised that it wasn't even on the paper. You know? It's so, so true. That goes back to what you said in the very beginning about that domino effect. If you don't, if our whole process is that, I, I go back to the, I honestly got the old school mentality of just get them in the door, get them in the door. Well, you, you slow down. Uh, Steve Russell ha has the whole, you know, date your internet leads. And it's really true. It's a slow down and get to know them first. Like, what is it? What is actually going on? Because what you may not understand, let's just take a third party lead. They may not even know, they may not even be aware that they submitted the lead to your store. Mm -hmm. You're on a third party site that lead is going to 20 different sites without them even knowing about it a lot of times. So they, may even be, they may have been on, you know, uh, Nissan site and somehow went to Toyota and you're, you're now bombarding them, telling me at the door, they're like, what the hell? I didn't even submit a lead to you. Why do you keep emailing me? Stop emailing me. And if you want to take the time to slow down and be like, oh, 
you are looking for a Nissan. You know what? That's great. Nissan's actually a great brand. Let me tell you about our Toyota 4Runner or Toyota RAV4. And you may have a chance to now actually convert that customer and that client over to you if you would just slow down. But instead of pissing off the customer, making them so frustrated that you're just you're just hitting them with an autoresponder every two seconds that makes absolutely no sense to them and slow down and personalize that response, you may now have a customer for life. And even let's say now they actually do buy the Nissan. Oh, you know, that's great. Let me tell you about our service department, how awesome our service department is. Oh, you're okay that I bought somewhere else? Yeah, we had sure. We have a kick-ass service department. Let me tell you how awesome they are. But once again, when you personalize that response and just slow down and not see them as a number, it's amazing the things that actually can develop throughout that entire process. And I, I, I love that you brought that up. So it's just like, there's so many things that go on in this mentality of just get them in the door, get them in the door. That was back in the day, that was the whole mindset and it worked and it was okay. Now you, you got to switch that mindset because it's, yeah, it doesn't work anymore. I mean, for some stores, I, I know that there's a lot of stores that still have that mindset and it works for them the, for a long process and a long legit uh, long career it's not going to work it eventually it's going to, to bite you at some point it yeah so i'll take that speaking of this of this whole thing that we're talking about right now is how can you encourage your employees to take ownership of that cust of those customer relationships and view them more than just a mere transaction well you have to take ownership of your position okay you have to realize the impact that your single position has in the whole dynamic inside the dealership, okay? Uh, it wasn't you realize that, then it's easier for you to take ownership of your interaction with the customer. BDRs, I mean, I manage the BDC department, and one thing that I tell them is like, you know, what, like we are kind of like the lungs of the dealership, right? I said, like, you know what, when there is no customers in the service drive or customers coming into the showroom and they're getting out of breath, we got to pump the air into those lungs, you know, and keep them breathing. So uh, a big responsibility, because if we don't do that, then it goes our service advisors are not going to have customers or mechanics are not going to be able to put, you know, put the hours that they need to. Our salespeople are not going to be able to have more opportunities to sell cars. So they're not going to be able to make a paycheck, you know? So there is a lot of mistakes just in our hands, just because of the interaction that we're going to have with that specific customer. So when we understand where we stand, okay, on, as a, in our position and the whole dynamic of the team, then it's easier for us to understand, I cannot jeopardize this. You know what? I have to do my best to get this customer, provide the best service, because it, I have a big responsibility on my shoulders, you know, I, you know, the, the responsibility of either this business saying, Hey, you know what? I don't need that many advisors. I don't need that many mechanics because business is going down and we're not bringing, we're not able to retain, but it should be like that on every single position. I say like, you have to assume where you fit on that puzzle. Okay. See how your uh, position affects everything else to be able to take that ownership when you have the customer in front of you, because otherwise you're not going to dismiss it. I'm going to give you a short example. Not that long ago, when I was coming back from Tampa, I fly through American Airlines and I had the worst experience. Okay. The worst experience, but the worst part of all of it is that my experience was based mostly placed on the interactions that I have with every single person that I could, I ever counter when I check in, in my, uh, you know, in Tampa, when I landed in Dallas, Texas, and when I landed in LA, it was the interaction that I have with each of those employees that made me swear that I will never fly again through America, our lives, and I will never recommend them ever again. So it wasn't much the airline or anything else, you know, it was the interaction that I have with that person. If one of, if each of them will have understood where they stand and how important their role is to keep the relationship with their customers, I will have probably, even though I have the same problems, even though I will have gone through the same troubles, but my interaction with them will have made my experience much better because at the end of the day, I know that it was out of their heads somehow is the way that they responded to. So realizing that they do have big responsibility because the reputation of the brand and of the dealership is on that interaction. Amen. It's 
and it's uh, yeah, I could go on and on about the uh, airlines in general. I mean, there's a reason I live in Chicago, but I fly Delta. It's not easy. Like I know that I'm going to have a connection everywhere, but it's because well, obviously I have a lot of miles with Delta. Even with that, I've flown other airlines, but it's because I literally was sitting on Delta. I was on an airline. I was on. I was like, the, the, we're getting ready to back away, and I hadn't seen that my bag tag. I hadn't seen that my bag had been checked on. So I literally posted on, and I'm rarely on Twitter. And I posted something on Twitter saying, uh, hope that they hope that my bag gets here. And I barely hit send. And Delta freaking reaches out to me while I'm on the plane and says, Hey Brooke, thank you so much for being a, you know, Titanium Platinum, whatever it is, member. Um, what's your bag number? I was like, I literally just hit send. Like we're on the plane getting ready to back out. And they go, what's your bag number? We can check for you right now. By the way, we can see you're sitting on roll, blah, blah, blah. They knew where I was sitting on the plane. By the time I hit, I, I, they're like, and they knew everything about it. They're like, oh, by the way, we can see your bag is loading. It's on the plane. Don't worry about it. I was like, and this is why I fly Delta. But it's regardless where your, where your brand, the loyalty lies, like this is the stuff. They understand the customer. When you take care of your employees first, your employees are going to take care of the customer. And so too often we think it's the customer first, but it's the employee. And then the employees are going to take care of the customer and all this because you're, I think so often to what, to your point is that we don't, we don't value ourselves. We don't value our job and our job is very important, but until you can see that you're not going to value every other step because I go and I'm just clocking in and clocking out. Well, no, because your interaction with the next person that comes to that door 100% 100% reflects on the brand, on everything they do, and that when that person comes back, you can make that entire person's you know day and whether they come back and ever do business with you and that brand ever again. Oh, oh my gosh, it makes such a difference. Such a difference. Oh, and you, I, mentioned, I, you mentioned another important point is that making sure that your teams also are in the right uh, you know, mindset you know, when they come to work. Because again, their own personal agendas, you know, we all, we're all humans. We're going to have issues, you know, we're going to have problems and then identify them, then realize it when one of them is going through, you know, through something and they don't have to share with you. I mean, like, of course, but sometimes being, it's showing the empathy to our employees as well. Okay. Because maybe something on the outside is making them have a rough day. And if they're having a rough day, you know, between themselves, it's going to be harder. It's going to take double or three times the energy for them to provide them and show the same empathy, you know, they, you know, show real, real care to your customers, you know. Mm-hmm. So sometimes, you know, have it, it, and sometimes it's just making them aware because how many times people walk into work and we are wearing this big, heavy weight for whatever it's outside, but we don't realize it, you know? So taking care of your team first. And, and another thing that you say is valuing your position, right? Understanding how valuable you are. Make them feel that. Yep. Make, 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 make them, you know, take pride of what they're due by the way that you value them and you make them feel. Because if you make them feel heard also, okay, Another thing is that, and very important when it comes to show caring, real, true caring for our customers, is making sure that we put processes in place that we're going to own that. Yes. Yeah. You know? Because if I preach this every single day, you know, and I have to tell my BDRs, make sure that you show empathy, make sure that you're caring, make sure that you're listening. And when they come with an issue that the customer may have to me, because they couldn't find a solution, a resolution, and they come to me for me to try to help the customer, and I just brush them off, you know? Then it will be like, okay, so why is she wanting me to do all of this if she's not going to own it either? Because we got to understand. I mean, there is a point, that's what we have managers, customer relation managers, things have to escalate. So if one escalates it to the next person or the manager, you don't own that, and you don't behave the way that you expect them to, you know, what will help the customer, the way that you're expecting them to do, you don't listen to the customer, you don't show them empathy, then they're going to go back to their seat and go like, so what's the point? Yep. You know, I greet my customer, I listen to my customer needs, I let them know, you know, the reasons why we may not be able to put them in this car, but this one is a much better choice and everything. And I get to my floor manager, I get to my sales managers and they just dismiss, oh, they cannot buy, let them go. 
why no, you know? They give me a reason why they're not able to purchase this car or they give me options that I can go and present, okay? Or this customer is upset because something happened in our service. Oh yeah, tell them that we're gonna give them a call when we get a chance. No, you know? Take that call, own that as an upper management also own the process and the, you know, the behaviors that you're expecting from your employees to do it, reflect it and, 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 and lead by the example. I, uh, yes. Like, and knowing, knowing that you will run through a wall for your employees, your employer, we're going to run through a wall for Very you, good. but you've got to know that you are going to invest in them and what is important from them and knowing that you're going to, Hey, I want to know why. And seeing that the verbal and nonverbal cues and knowing that you actually care about them and have empathy for them is only going to translate to them doing it for their, their, the clients and for the customers. So I want to take a little bit different direction on this is that we're saying, okay, have empathy into, I know we're talking about feelings portion of facts, not feelings, but it's because it, it correlates so well to the ROI portion of your business. So is there any risk in your mind of employees maybe feeling, I don't know, emotionally drained or experiencing maybe burnout when they're saying, hey, be invested emotionally, emotionally at work? And is there, do you see any maybe downside of this at all? Yes. You know, you have to give time to, uh, uh, like I give time to my teams to breathe. Okay. You know, there are going to be very difficult customers. There are going to be customers that no matter how you present and you try to deliver the message, they're going to take it in a different way, you know, and it's going to, and you have to make sure that you don't leave your team alone. That's the most important things yeah. that you're right there for your team. Okay. That if they're getting into that situation that you take over. Okay. And maybe it's not because, well, but why will I take over? You know, I'm not going to get anywhere else that they already offering. Because I hear that on my, you know, sometimes we hear in the sales side, service side, right? You know, like, yeah, they're already handling. They already want to tell the customer that this is what we can do. But what we are understanding is that the customer keeps coming back to our salesperson, to our BDC rep, to our service advisor, and they're not taking the message because they want another person in a different level to maybe deliver exactly the same word. So do not leave them alone. And when that happened, you know, take over the situation, okay? And when that happened, tell the person that was handling to breathe and give them some time because you have to let that go, okay? It takes a lot, a lot of energy, especially when you're like, like a service advisor, you know, a salesperson, a BDR, going over and over. Because sometimes as a salesperson, you hear them at the end of the day, okay, I got three, you know, and I'm just feel be done. Right? Or your BDR said, oh God, today, what was it? You know, something on the moon, something on the sun. You know, everybody seems like to be like, you know, a little bit extra today. And they're drained. They are drained. And on top of that, you put their personal problems or their personal life. So it's, we, I, I like to coach not only on how to handle customers, but also, you know, how to, you know, take the day by day, you know, how to sometimes snap out of a negative situation and shake it off, right? Sometimes I tell them, go for a walk. You need to go outside and walk. You know, you need to switch, you know, and, and right there because it it break, it drains you. At the end of the day, it drains you. So it's a, it's a hard part and it's something that you have to be very attentive. When you, you have teams, you have to pay, pay, pay a lot of attention to how's the day going, you know, and, and, and all of the challenges that they have got through the day as well. I love it. So when you've got a, you have a new employee coming on and how, how can, I'll say, how can we, but also how do you then go and train your new employees to embody this culture of genuine care from the very first day? Cause a lot of companies, this might be something new to them. And as I, I was, Sometimes in our auto industry, this might be a little foreign, foreign, a lot of people are doing a great job, but obviously you're, you're, kicking butt at this one. So how, how can we do this? How do you do this from day one with a new employee? So when I get a new hire, and I think actually on the interview process, I mentioned this, I let them know that I like to work with teams where we have a really good uh, vibe, you will say, right? I said, you're coming into a team where I want you to come every day and feel happy about it. Okay, I need you because first thing that I always also tell them that we're going to help each other to be better every day. 
We're going to help each other to learn more every day. We're going to help each other when they have challenges. Okay. We're going to help them, you know, to become better humans and to overcome objections in the best way that we can. We're going to support you. Okay. When you're down or when you're not, when you want to share, if you, you want us, I want you to feel this like a safe place to share if there is something weighing you down. Okay. And because you're going to spend more time here than you're going to spend with your family. Okay. You're going to spend more time here than you may spend with your kids or with your loved ones. So it's very important for me and for our team to make sure that this is, that you feel comfortable because if you feel good, if you feel happy about what we do and how we do it, that is going to reflect on the way that you're going to talk to our customers. You know, and at the same time, it's going to help you when we have that customer that is very difficult to move on because negativity is not something that we're going to, you know, like we're going to let you're going to be able to vent where you're going to be able to calm down and we're going to help you go back to a positive mindset. OK, because that's going to help all of us. OK, move forward throughout the day because it's four walls. I tell them it's four walls. It's like 10 of us. So there is a lot of energy and the energy that has to flow, it has to be positive. It has to, right? So they understand, you know, and when something happens, sometimes we're like, okay, so like, let, let's not complain and move forward. Um, so I do tell them that since the very, very first day, you know, and when there is a challenge, when there is something that could have been, then there is miscommunication. I say, always let's bring it to the table and clear the water. Because if we think that, Problems are going to solve on their own. Uh, uh, there's sometimes they just get bad, big. And it's with processes, you know, at the dealership, when something is going on, you know, it, you better like um, address them right away and find the, the root of the problem that we're talking outside of the conversation. Find the root of the problem, okay, to avoid the frustrations that your employees are going to go through. So I'm going to take that one step further is that so you're in a position now that maybe upper management's maybe a little resistance to culture change. <laughs> so how do you navigate and overcome resistance to culture change at the top management level? Because I know, uh, I know you just took a I'm gonna stall here for a hot second here, is that I, I, I've been that position on multiple different, I've, I've had the pleasure of working in a lot of different dealerships and a lot of different uh, businesses. And we all can go back and be like, yeah, that was pretty much a pretty toxic environment uh, that I was working in. So from your experience of, of seeing other dealerships and seeing businesses, how do you navigate and overcome those resistance to this culture change at a top management level? I have a team, a management team that is very open, you know, very open to the new culture. Okay. And we try to embrace it as much as possible. Okay. Especially among the employees, because I think that they understand that if we, again, if we have that, energy around us, it will be easier to us to transmit it. But I have been in dealerships where it has been a completely challenge. And sometimes it, it, has, it hasn't even been able to navigate it. You know, getting out of the old mentality is the hardest part. Okay. So at that moment, at those times, and I think the best uh, practice that I, I do when, when something like that happens is bring, bring the examples or bring the situations into the table. The more that you, because what happened is sometimes they assume, oh, no, 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 that is not an issue. We don't have that issue. You know, that never happens over here. Oh, no, 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 no. So you bring your game to that. And I said, we need to work on this. We need to establish a process to prevent this. And then they go like, nope, nope, we don't need that. So what I do, what I have done is like, okay, I keep sending the sample. Okay, you know, by the way, this customer, this is this happened. Here's one. And then here's another one. And eventually... They actually see that what they see that has always been working is actually not working. Because in the past, I will have come to management and said, well, you know what? The customers keep asking for this one. Really? How many customers? Okay. How often does it happen? And then I'm like, it happens a lot. They want facts, right? They, they want, because your upper management team wants that. So... A, long, a while ago, I changed my strategy and I go, okay, here it is. These are the three situations this week, just along this week or this or today, okay, where 
do you remember what we mentioned or we talked about it before where we actually, you know, this is how it's affecting us and this is how your customer reacted and, you know, the consequences that we had to face. So when they see real facts, because that's what they wanted to see, then they are more open to establish and, you know, and change the, you know, the processes and they they to change their own mentality as well. It's so true. It's so true. As I'm looking at these other questions, like you just answered like three or more. I'm like, well, we hit that one. We hit that one. I, I, I guess the, the next one I'm going to go with is how do you demonstrate the business value of genuine customer care to a skeptical man- management team? So maybe you've got a manager now that's like, yeah, not really sure about that. Not sure really to buy in. And you're like, you, you, you keep throwing down facts, the, the management, and they're just still a little skeptical. And you just can't, you're having a rough time breaking through. Is there, what other, what other things would you do? Sometimes I think you have to let them hit the wall. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. You have to let them hit the wall because there is just so much sometimes that you can do. And then when they hit the wall and you hand them some eyes to put them on their head, right? <laughs> or the bump. <laughs> yes. And at that point... Sometimes instead of saying, I told you so, right? Because nobody likes to hear that, especially when like, you're like trying to recover, is, you know, advising, okay? Okay, we had the situation with this customer. And instead of saying, do you remember, you know, I told you that if we, we should have done this or we should have done that or this is what we need to do. Instead of doing that, say it's like, okay, you know what? So the next time what we can do to prevent this from happening, it's what about if we implement something like this from now on and trying to make them see like their idea. Okay. So it, it, so it prevents you from that headache again, from hitting that wall again. Okay. It's like I said, bring in the example. Sometimes you try to bring the example before it continue happening to others. Right. But sometimes it have to happen to them. Okay. In, or in order for them to be open to the idea and to actually change their mentality, okay? We have had situations where, you know, maybe a customer wasn't as happy as they thought it was, right? After we sold them the car, and maybe the customer came into the showroom and they started, like, you know, a different type of, like, a situation right and then, and they had it to go and handle it. And, you know, all friend and help, hey, it's, you know, let, let, let's help. You know, instead of just being an spectator, you know, helping out, okay, and help them navigate that situation and say, okay, well, you know, let's, let's, how can we prevent, how, how can, what can we do better the next time that this happened? No, what we could have done better in this situation, but what we could do better in the next time that this happens. So they are more open-minded about it and they realize, well, and eventually they will be like, you know what, I, I see now, what was the point of us? changing our mentality in and when it comes to these situations i think it's a lot like a kid sometimes is that you, you want to protect your kids so much right and then right. sometimes your kid your kids are going to fall down and they're going to scrape their knee you know sometimes they touch the hot stove when you tell them don't touch the hot stove okay i'm going to touch the hot stove i'm like i told you not to do that but the kid has to learn that hey i that i have to do that to to prove to myself it's not going to work you're like okay go ahead and do that when you do that now you're not going to be like you stupid kid. I told you not to do that. They just have to do that to understand that, okay, that one plus one equals two. I shouldn't do that anymore. And then the light bulb switches on. So how do you then handle situations where there's a conflict now? Because I know there's never conflicts in our industry, never, but between sales targets and providing that genuine customer care to the, to the, uh, the client and the customer. Targets will always, we, we, we live and die by the targets, right? Right. Perfect. I love it. <laughs> so, because we're talking about a culture change, okay? We're talking about changing the way that we have been doing business for such a long time, right? Especially now after uh, all of the situations that we have gone through, pandemic, the shortage of inventory. So I think it's very important for us managers to understand that while we try to implement those changes on the culture, our targets may need to be readjusted, okay? Because we may not get the same level of performers of, you know, maybe it's going to be better. But during that time, during that transition time, okay, we need to be a little bit more understanding and, 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 and also see, okay, did we put the effort to get and hit the target? Maybe we did, right? But it, 
like, I always see it like this, you know, you have a restaurant, right? And then all of a sudden your restaurant is, you know, clients are not coming in. Okay. Because they read all of the bad reviews because they had a bad experience. So now you don't have customers. Mm -hmm. So what you're going to do, it's maybe hire new waiters or maybe find the reason what the, the root of the problem is and try to change the way that they attend to the customers that you, you're seeing right now while you start seeing, again, customers coming back to you and giving you a second chance. So you're going to suffer a little bit, okay? But th you're going to suffer a little bit and you need to readjust to that, you know, you, your goals and, and all of your target while you're going through that transition. Because first of all, you need to find out the reasons why their customers are not you know, connecting with you and when you're not hitting anyways the target, okay, implement the process to try to change the culture and the mentality, retrain, coach constantly your teams, okay, and eventually little by little you're going to be getting again to the targets that you had before. But you cannot, I, I think it's very difficult to keep a high target and also change mentality or, 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 or culture at the same time. One of the two, has to like move up or down, you know? I think the target has to be adjusted while you're making the change in your culture. And all of a sudden that change in culture is just going to, you know, jump your targets even more because you, you're gonna realize, oh, wow, you know, everything is doing much, much better. Amen, amen. Well, it has been, I, it has been so much fun having you on the show and there's been so much the knowledge that's been dropped as we're going through all this, as this man, there's just, oh my goodness, I'm hoping that everyone is taking notes as we're going through all this, I'm like, holy shnikes. But we have reached the, the, the I would say the other portion of the show where I'm going. We are now into the lightning round with you now. The first and foremost is those that are watching, we've got your wonderful personalized link behind, right underneath here. For those that are listening, how can the audience find you? How can they get in touch with you? Oh, very easy. You know, I, I'm all the time in Lincoln, you know, <laughs> I need to start posting more. Okay. I need to make that more of a habit. Um, I, I love sharing everything that I know and, you know, helping on any way that I can. So you can go ahead and connect right there at the link. Okay. All my information is right there. My email, my phone number, you know, should be a text or anything that I'm, I'm not here to, to help us be better, to help us grow and to help us connect. And I will say that I was, we had spoke, we both uh, were on a panel together at Digital Dealer and afterwards we were connecting and you were going over to some of your follow-up and I, you know, we were just talking numbers whenever I just go, you understand that like you're so far above everybody else and you're like, really? I was like, no, like, believe me, I see a lot of dealerships. You're so far above everybody else. So definitely connect with this woman. She is a brilliant human being. Definitely, definitely connect with her. So next, thank you, all, you so thank much. You, thank you. So next question is, where's your favorite vacation spot? You've either got a one-way ticket. You don't have to come home. I mean, if you want to come back, you can. But where are you going on vacation? Where's your go-to spot? Home. You know, El Salvador. Going back. <laughs> You're like, I might not come back. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'll come back. And another, you know, yes, I think right now it will be probably home right now. You know, nice. Fantastic. Do you still have family there? I still have family over there, yes. And I still have a lot of places to explore. You know, there is tons of places that growing up, I didn't get a chance. In my, in my country, I think it's smaller than Los Angeles, okay? <laughs> yes, my country is very, very tiny. But um, I grew up during the time that there was war in my country. So we didn't go to specific areas. And right now, there is just so much to discover that, um, yeah, that I, I think that... And, um, Another place will be Savannah, Savannah, Georgia. Yeah. Nice, fantastic. Well, both great places. Both great places. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love both of them. You love your flight. Sorry. <laughs> so it's all good. You know, everybody wants to come on the show. It's all good. We'll take it. It's all good. <laughs> My dog, it's <laughs> keep it. It's, it's all good. It's over there. We, we like to keep it at your show on the show. It's, it's all good. All right. So name the show's facts, not feelings. So whether it's in your personal life or in business, how are you distinguishing facts from feelings? My, 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 when it's my feelings, and you know what? And it's curious because I thought about this question and I know the answer was completely different. And right now I completely forgot what I thought before. It's my, my facts for my feelings. Sometimes it's hard 
to put a difference between the two, right? Uh, and sometimes you have to put the feelings apart to understand the facts. Definitely, right? That's what everybody said. How do I do that? Uh, I think I best spot on what is practical, what is necessary to be done. Okay, because my feeling, my feelings are not always going to be uh, rational. Okay, because sometimes the feelings are just going to be taken by impulse or they 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 they, they, they feeling up right of the moment, right? So, oh God, it's that's one of the most difficult questions, you know. <laughs> I, I think I I don't even think I'm expressing myself. What, and I wrote it down because I knew that you were going to ask me that question. I wrote it down and I was like, I'm just like, my mind went just like, you know, it's all good. Well, I, I, if, if, I, if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that you're, uh, when it comes to the feelings, it's way emotional and they need to like, you know, think before and slow down, take a breath and then let the emotion out of it and then rationally think about it and then answer or respond or act after the emotion has been taken out of it. Is that what I'm hearing? Yes. And, you know, but I'm a, I'm a person that it takes a lot of into consideration what the, the, what the situation is coming from. Okay. What, what is the situation exactly coming from? And what also what it feels is because when it comes to customers making decisions, yeah, we got to go by the facts, right? These are the reasons that we may not be able to do that. But also, you know, what are the feels that the customers are having at the moment in, in order for me to be able to explain the facts in a better way? So, Yes, you put the feelings on the side to make decisions, personal decisions, business decisions. Okay, but I still think that some some part of some of the feelings need to be, be taken as still into consideration. You don't need to let your feelings rule the decision. That is very different yes. because you may be feeling angry, you may be feeling sad. You know, so look, you don't let those rule the decision. You know, you base that on uh, some of the facts, but. You want to see how the facts may affect down the road the feelings of whatever is or whoever is involved. I, I, I get what you're throwing down. I, I get it. I get I, it. I, I think I make my, I don't know. I have to write it down. Sometimes, you say sometimes between my English and my Spanish, I flip all, all you're like your day, English language. Come on. <laughs> and, you know, and right now I'm trying to learn Italian. So I don't know how that's. Oh my. So, so hold up. That, that's, we're going to throw another question in here. How many languages do you speak? I speak two. I speak okay. English and Spanish. You know, and right okay. now I'm trying to learn in Italian. Oh my goodness, man. I struggle with English. Come on. I speak Brookish really well, but that's, you know, I'm fluent in Brookish, then English. I, I, I Spanish, I, really I, can, I can understand it, speaking it, uh, uh, but I can understand it. But I really have my own words. So, you know, my teams already know my vocabulary. And sometimes when there is a new hire and they look at me, it's like, what did she try to say? Oh, she meant this, but, you know, she, <laughs> she has her own word. Yeah, that's me. That's Brookish. It's like I'll, there are very few people that understand Brookish and they're fluent, but there's a few people that are fluent in Brookish. So I, I understand that. I understand that. Okay, let's go with the hopefully an easy question for you. What is your favorite car? Ha uh, ha! You uh, are. Oh, shoot! I started. I I want. I think the Lexus. Uh, my favorite cars are always been Lexus. Okay. Okay. Uh, that's a good. One. I agree. I know it's not a sport car. You know, I don't. I no, like they're, either, they're but... sexy, man. They're sexy. I like them. They're a good yeah, choice. I'm afraid of driving them. <laughs> you're afraid. Uh, what, you're afraid of driving them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. I, I've all right. so many stories. You know, people driving for the first time one of those fancy, nice, like speed, like you know, racing cars, and the first thing that they do is go crash down. So I, I drive fast. Don't take me wrong. That's why you got gap insurance. Really, You'll be fine. Really, really fast. Listen, I think probably I had some of the fastest Priuses that there are ever out there. <laughs> well, the fast and Prius doesn't go together. I'm confused. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I disagree right there. So, <laughs> Prius is considered one of the slowest vehicles, but you know, it's it's yeah. not the driver. It is not the car. It's the driver. <laughs> Okay, I, I'm going to need some video evidence of this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a fun, a fun little story right here. I was about to return my lease a couple of years ago at my other Toyota dealership, right? And there is this customer that was looking for a Prius dark gray package four at that time. So my used car manager walks in and says, oh, you know what? She drives one. I go like, Martha, so like, when is your lease due? Because this gentleman is looking for exactly for your car. So maybe he can buy your car. He said, oh, it's due like in a month or so. I'm like, I said, but I can return it before if you want to. He goes like, do you want to go and take it for a test drive? 
He goes like, well, your mind uh, said, just go and drive it. So he goes and drives a Prius, right? And he comes back. He's like, so how do you like it? He's like, it drives different. It goes like, than the ones that you have over here. And then I look at him, it drives faster, right? It goes like, yes. I said, how do you know? Because I'm a fast driver. <laughs> and then it's like, it did drive different. It's like, it takes out, you know, it has a quick take takeoff. Yeah, so like, because my car has learned how I drive it. So my Prius is fast Prius. He bought my car. Oh, of course he did. Of course he did. I love it. Okay, well, you know, I'm going to end on that one because that's a, that is the first time I've ever heard of anyone saying fast and Prius in the same sentence ever. I've ever heard that those two words in the same sentence <laughs> ever. Hey, GM used to drive a BMW. We would get on the freeway because we had it to be at 8 o'clock on Friday meetings. We will get on the freeway. Sometime we'll go, there she goes. He passed me and she passed me again. I said, like, it's not the car, it's the driver. I it is the driver. It is. I, it very much is the driver. Because I've seen people and, yeah. No, I, yeah. Well, you the, see, that's what I'm afraid of driving a speed car, <laughs> like a fast car, because I don't know what type of damage I would be doing, you know, out there. Uh, I remember the first, yeah, yeah. I, we'll, we'll have to save you the story. Because I remember the first car that I, that my first, like, luxury vehicle that I purchased, and I get it, get in, and I, I also have a bit of a problem speeding. And I got in, I just like, boom, took off. I was like, oh, this is going to be dangerous. <laughs> so, you know what I really wanted to do? Go on those uh, uh, speed tracks, you know, race tracks. Yeah. And really, you know, when I know that I don't have to worry about all the traffic and anything else, and really step on the on one of those cars. See, things I didn't know about you, the things I'm learning today. <laughs> well, I'll, one day I'll do that. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank it's you so much for, for having me. It has been amazing. Such a pleasure. And everyone, if you, like I said, if you haven't already connected with this wonderful woman, please do. She is, like I said, it's just so much knowledge coming from her today. She is, uh, one, she's an amazing human being, but she just, she thank knows you. the much and she's an incredible human being. And with that, everyone, find a way to serve find a way to help someone to help your your neighbor, your colleague, someone today, whether that's a kind smile, whether that's open a door for someone, but just find a way to serve a day. With that, everyone, we'll see everybody next week.